Introducing NASM One, NASM's ultimate membership program. Unlock access to everything your fitness career needs to succeed. Unlimited CEUs, free courses, access to our premium app, and exclusive discounts, all for $35 a month. NASM One is best in class tools, cutting edge certifications, confidence in your craft, and everything you do as a personal trainer made easy so we can achieve our greatest goals together as one. Welcome to Strong Mind, Strong Body. I'm your host, Angie Miller. And today I have a very special guest, CJ Lee. And CJ is a very seasoned entrepreneur in the fitness space. I met him last year in Singapore. We both spoke on a panel. The great news is what CJ is going to talk about today is something that I think is really exciting. And it's something that I know little about. And I know a lot of you are interested in this. It's how to open a gym without any money. What? How do you open a big gym when you don't have the revenue? Well, CJ's going to come in and he's going to help you kind of talk about how to get a compelling pitch deck and how to navigate through common pitfalls when you're working with investors. He's got a wealth of information he's going to share. I can't bring wait to bring him in and have him introduce himself. So CJ, why don't you come in and introduce yourself? Hey, good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are. Thank you so much for having me on the show. It is a pleasure for me to share this little known knowledge to many of you out there who could be thinking like, hey, I want to start a gym. I'm ready to go. I have the wealth of experience. I know what to do exactly when it comes to coaching and serving clients at highest level, but I just don't have the money, All right? So I'm going to share with you how you can do that. And it's a proven Thing that we've been doing for the last three years and this is something we, we keep going on and going on and going on for the well this, that's a plan for the next few years actually so um without any of your money would be a better term <laughs> you All know right. what so um that's where you've got me, CJ, is the minute somebody says, I don't have to spend my money. I'm like, oh, well, talk to me then. So I'm going to give everyone a little context. So CJ, you live in Malaysia, correct? Yep. And um, so the reason why CJ at the beginning, when he was like morning, night, which is it? Because it's like six in the morning, CJ's time and six at night, my time here in Charlotte. So amazing that we can connect. So CJ, that's a great way to start because here's the thing. All of us would probably have all these big dreams and goals if money weren't an issue. So let's start with that. How in the world do you open a gym without any money? How does it work? And why don't you just start? Because I know you generally start by talking about your, your like MVP. Tell us what the MVP is and what you mean by that. All right. So MVP is basically a term defined as minimum viable product. So it's really important to have some traction when it comes to starting a business and before pitching to investors. So this is where we are getting into, right? So what you're going to be doing is um, creating something where there's a bit of traction. You have already proven yourself that there are sales coming in. There's a certain number that people will be drawn to, right? It could be the fact that you are collecting consistent cash, cash flow or renewal from your clients. and the profit margin is healthy and there is a bit of growth every single month, just that you need the extra funding from investors to take things to next level. So MVP is really, really important. Now, disclaimer for all of you here, you can't just go out and pitch for money or go ask for money if you don't have a strong MVP. Okay. So it's really important to have some MVP. Now, at the same time, the question for you is, you know, how long do you need to have your MVP built up? Because, you know, some people might, might be thinking, do I need a year or six months or three months? Mm -hmm. Well, at the end of the day, there's no hard and fast rule, right? It also comes down to the people that you are going to be pitching the funding from. Because at the end of the day, I believe that people invest in people. People don't just invest because your business or MVP is amazing. People in, invest in you. People feel like they can trust you. 
because at the end of the day, you are the rise and fall of a business. So basically a, an MVP, right? You can read up further online, how to create it, how to build it exactly. And um, basically that is the key element. Okay. I see a lot of people do not have the MVP. They go out there and pitch for funding. They're thinking, um, hey, I don't want to use my money. I want to go out and use my friends, family, or fools, the three Fs, <laughs> money. And, and quite often they, they fail terribly because they don't have a, 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 an MVP. So they can be pitching all day long, but not getting anywhere. So um, <laughs> friends, family, or fools. Okay. Um, so what I like was the word, I caught the word trust. And I couldn't agree more. I think that anytime you're going to ask anyone for money, whether they've got deep pockets or not so deep pockets, trust is a huge factor. They're investing in you. And so you have to build their trust. And I like the idea of knowing your numbers really, really well. And to your point, is there an exact science to that? Probably not. Is it a year? Is it six months? I think just to your point, you've got to know them really well, be very solid and be a very trusting person or very trustworthy person. So um, I like that. Is there anything else you want to say about MVP or do you want to talk about that pitch deck that you're going to create? All right. So basically, we can definitely go further into MVP. All right. Um, now, when I used to start my first ever studio venture, all right. And my MVP was basically me being a personal trainer, me being great at serving clients. And my client could see that, like the passion, the energy I put into, and of course, the result that she was getting. And then from there, she that was basically the MVP, right? So I was training this client of mine for about eight months. Then she got talking about, hey, look, you know, I believe you can do more. And I was like, really? Uh, what do you mean? <laughs> That's when I got caught off guard and I was like, yeah, maybe I could do more. So that was my MVP. Now, your MVP could look like maybe you are doing some boot camp outdoor. You're having, you know, consistently 10, 20 people day in, day out, week in, week out. And then you have already been doing it for the last six months or a year. And, you know, it, it, it's pretty obvious that the next thing you need is a solid space where you're not affected by weather or you're not affected by, um, you know, like, the, the muddy fuel and and winter snow whatever condition right so then you know you, you know that mvp is already quite there and therefore when it comes to creating a pitch deck which is something that we're going to talk about next all right a pitch deck is the tool to unlock the money that you want all right so uh, the pitch deck is basically um, what makes all the difference because you can't just ask your friend or fools or family like, hey, can I have some money, right? So you got to have a, t a tool, a pitch deck, a PDF format pitch deck for them to see the solution that you are providing to the marketplace, right? The value you're pro providing, how you're going to grow and so on and so forth. All right. Okay. So I want to pause here for a minute. I like how you you mentioned, you know, your client saw something in you. And that really resonated with me because I can't tell you how many times over the years that someone has seen something in me and then that inspired me to see something in me. And I do think that a lot of times our clients are the best in the best position to kind of promote us and build us up at, in our in our business. So just kind of curiosity, this client who said that to you, did that just act as inspiration for you? Or did she, was she one of the people who invested in you? Yeah. So basically it was an inspiration at first, at, at the very beginning, it was basically like, I was trying to get her to invest in the gym I was working for, right? I was an employee there. I really believe in the vision. I love the team. And I was like, Hey, maybe you can be part of this and then, of course, uh, after seeing the, the numbers, she was like, hey, why don't we start our own thing? You got what it takes. And I was like, really? <laughs> and then it got me thinking, yeah, maybe we could start our own thing. And, you know, that was back in Thailand. So the timing was right because I felt like I was wanting to go back to Malaysia to be closer to my family. So it got me thinking like, yeah, how, how can I be closer to family and also have a business going at the same time? So that was the very same client that in, you know, invested together. 
And then, yeah, it, it's led me to where I am today. Of course, along the way, um, there are other stories where, you know, clients were also investing in, in the current business that, that I'm in. And it was just really cool to see, you know, our clients are our biggest fans if you serve them right. They don't question so much in, into the numbers like a venture capitalist or like a, a, a financial banking investment thing, right? They, they just, you know, listen to your pitch. They look you in the eyes. They're like, okay, let's do it. I'm like, don't you want to know more? <laughs> I feel bad for not telling them more. But then they're like, yeah, let's, go, let's do it. Wow. And it worked. So let's go into the pitch deck because I love this idea. I, I, it's interesting because whether you're a speaker or you're a coach, you do need that pitch deck. You need to put something in front of people that they can tangibly see and say, this is who I am. This is the problem I'm going to solve for you. And that also builds trust that you took the time to develop a product for them to preview to say, this is what you're going to get if you get CJ. So tell me how you do your pitch deck. All right. It's always starting with problem that you are solving, all right? Because otherwise your thing is just another nice to have offer in the market. So the problem, well, basically, I think a lot of us know the problem we are solving, but rarely do we sit down and just type it down thinking through, is that really the core problem we are solving or is that just a problem that is not really that big of a deal? So yes, you, you got to make sure that the problem is painful enough for people, right? And of course, the problem has to be relevant to the target market that you are going to be um, aiming for, right? Because of course, there are a lot of problems out there you can solve, but then it also, it also comes down to who, that, who you want to solve the problem for, right? For example, um, let's say for us, we are private studio, one-on-one -on -one personal training studio, appointment-based. So... Basically, the problem we are solving is for people who just like to have their own space, like to have, you know, a proper coaching environment and also program and services. And also the problem of, you know, they're going into a, a gym, they're being intimidated, they don't know what to do. Even if they have a PT on the ground, they still feel really, really intimidated. So, so this is a problem that we're trying to solve, especially we are aiming for the mid to high, uh, higher end of the market where they just, you know, we'd rather pay more, right? Just like how people pay more for business class. Yeah. It's the same thing. You're flying from A to B, you're paying triple the amounts, but they're happy to do that. They just want to have some space and have some peace to themselves, being able to just feel good, you know, without being distracted. So always, always important to start with a problem that is relevant to the specific target market that you are going to serve. And of course, uh, after that, then you talk about a solution, all right? So the solution will basically, it has to be somewhat unique and interesting. It has to have a, an X factor, right? It can't just be a, the solution of becoming a one-on-one -on -one PT studio or offering a PT studio um, you know, business as a solution. It has to be more than that. So you can think of, okay, now I can identify there are many ways to build a PT studio. What is the unique factor or unique selling points that you can bring to the market that no one else or rarely do anyone is doing it? All right, Angie, any questions so far? <laughs> So, yeah. So when I think about, you know, I think about the story brand and, you know, Donald Miller and his whole story brand concept. And, and again, I think that all of us at some point have kind of learned about this pitch tech concept and everybody approaches that a little bit different, but yes, it's always starting with that problem. How do I solve a problem for you? Because why would you want to hire me if you don't have a problem I need to solve? So when you then, you then go into how do you provide that solution? It's a solution focused approach. Well, I like how you're saying, you know, it's personalized because some people just want a very personal experience and that's, you know, you're, you're providing them solutions based on their individual needs. Did I get that pretty good so far? <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. And it has to be somewhat different from the marketplace, you know, otherwise your investor, your, your guest to the pitching session would be like, I hear that every single day. I see that every single where. So why, why am I going to put in money where you are going to get yourself into a highly competitive space? Yeah, so it has to have an X factor.
Okay. So yeah, that was the part that definitely the whole niche thing that what sets you apart from other trainers or what sets you apart from other coaches? What do you do that is different from everyone else? And we all have that thing. I believe that every trainer out there has a special something that sets them apart. Just like I believe every coach out there has a something that sets them apart. That's why I don't believe in the whole, we don't need to be afraid of each other or threatened by each other. We can just learn from each other. But CJ, before you go on with the pitch deck, I want to do a quick recap here. So first of all, I'm talking to CJ Lee, and he is a fitness entrepreneur. My name is Angie, and this is Strong Mind, Strong Body. And we're talking about no money. How do you open a gym without any money? So CJ has talked about having your MVP, and now he's talking about a pitch deck. So let's move on from the solution. Where do we go from there? All right. So of the solution, basically, I based on what I've seen over the last 50 different pitch decks, you know, from attending other people's pitching sessions to, you know, like learning from different mentors, there's really no exact sequence you must have. As long as the, the main thing you start with problem, solution, and afterwards, you can have elements such as market positioning. This is very important, right? Where your investor or your audience can see like how different are you in the market? Is it different in a way that, you know, perhaps your pricing is on the high end, like, like us, we are probably the most expensive personal training business studio that provide the, you know, PTs in, in, in Malaysia. So let, let me say again, we're probably the most expensive personal training um, coaching services in Malaysia, right? So that's one of the USP. That's one of the positioning, right? And then at the same time, are you more coaching result driven or are you more membership driven, right? Or are you more a facility providing kind of um, business model or you are more into the personalized approach? So yes, you can really, really um, think of, you know, a few factors that can help you map out the different positioning that, you know, all the players in the market are in, where you're at, plot it where you are actually in a no man's land, which is a good thing. Okay, so market positioning is, in, is one way. Another one is total addressable market. So a lot of time we have great ideas, but sometimes you know you have to ask yourself: Is there actually a huge demand? Because you never know your business might grow and you might want to scale it, but then you don't want to be you 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 don't want to end up with you know like oh wow, I just realized not many people want this thing. Right, so total address addressable market. A lot of time you can find it on uh, online. Of course, nowadays you have ChatGPT doing the research for you. That's really great. But of course, they will give you the link to go back to the source. You can dig deeper, and that's really really important. Okay, uh, some of you might have the dream to build a big business, right? So total addressable market or the TAM is super important. Okay, and then the next one will be, of course, your, your, your traction with your MVP. Okay, show the number, show it in graph, all right, year on year or month on month or week on week kind of growth. And the beauty of having non-proven business model, not MVP, business model, the, the beauty of having non-proven business model is that you can basically sell a dream, all right? And it's, it's very, very, it's, it's going to be, it's going to allow you to raise funds a lot quicker. Let me put it this way, all right? Because when you have a proven business model for the last two years, three years, you are, you know, if you're pitching for the same thing, then investor will be seeing like, hey, for the last one or two years, these are the numbers. And it's very hard for them to imagine how much more you can grow, even though you say it's going to be a 30% year on year growth every single year or 10% growth month on month. It's very hard to believe. So a lot of you might be thinking like, I'm afraid to pitch because uh, I don't have anything proven. At the same time, I want you to think like shift your belief system to think that, hey, it's actually a good opportunity that I don't have any proven business model yet. So that gives you a huge advantage to pitch, to, to sell the dream to your investor. Just like how Jack Ma used to do with Alibaba back in the day. He had no, of course, no tech company set up. So he was pitching to SoftBank, I think. 
And basically, they just put in eight figures into him into a thing that didn't even exist, right? So this is the beauty of not having a proven business model. But of course, you have to have one very soon once you get the money. Okay. So basically what you're saying is not having a proven business model can invite in an opportunity for you to create a visual image for these investors and say, this is what I know I can create. And then you're calling upon their creativity and their entrepreneurial spirit and saying, if you give me the opportunity, I can do this. And I like that. I also like that you said, it's okay to be in no man's land. Meaning, because I think what you were saying there is not a place where everyone is. So you're an outlier. An outlier stand out because they're not in the mix. They're not getting lost in the noise, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. I like that. Yep. So yep. very cool. So anything else on the pitch deck or what do you think? All right. And the next one is one very, very key element. Okay. This is probably something where a lot of people neglect. They just think that you just need the numbers and a beautifully, a beautifully designed pitch deck and a bunch of uh, stats. But I would say, like I say in the beginning, people invest in people. Now, seasoned and experienced investor know to look out for this one thing is your team formation. If you are the only founder, okay, some investor might be a little worried. Like, okay, uh, you know, do you not have a partner? Because business this day and age, you need a co-founder. Seriously, <laughs> like you can hire the best people, but they don't have that sense of ownership. The level of uh, commitment and also the work intensity is definitely going to be different than a co-founder, right? If you look at... Um, uh, if you look at Apple, right, Steve Jobs is not the only guy, right? Mm -hmm. If you look at Google, Google has co-founders. If you look at many, many successful businesses, they have all have co-founders. Now, the investor will be looking at who is the other half, all right? And what is that person going to bring to the table? What are you going to bring to the table? Now, if you already have a company or if you have a company structure that you feel like this is going to be the way going forward, whether you're pitching for your current business to grow or you're pitching for a new business, your, your formation needs to have uh, people of different strength. Not everyone should be good at coaching, for example, right? This is the biggest mistake a lot of personal trainers make. They're like, oh, I like this guy and that guy. All of us are coaches. We are all great coaches. We bump into each other every now and then. We start to talk about dreams of opening our studios together. But all of you are coaches. The investor will be like, who's the finance person? Who is the, the person <laughs> that, that is going to be driving the, the strategy, right? So, and then one other important element is having a balance of male and female in a team is very, very important because as males, right, investors know that males tend to make impulsive decision. Males tend to make decisions based on dopamine hit coming along and they're like, let's do it. Let's, you know, LFG, right? <laughs> right. Let's freaking go. But then female helps to keep things in balance, right? This is what invest some investors the smarter ones or the experienced ones will be looking at so keep that in mind just because you are the founder not having another co-founder doesn't make you any more significant doesn't make you any better than having a team right just because you have um, a team of eight strong dominant alpha male coaches you know going to be joining you is not always a good thing <laughs> Yeah, I like that. I like that perspective. I think that's really key to consider. It's just balance in general, balance in personality, balance in skill sets, balance in how you're going to create this vision in this company because balance is good. I mean, two people don't marry because they're exactly alike. They marry because they both bring something in different to the marriage and in any relationship. And, and I think the same can be said in a business situation. You just need overall balance in the dynamics of your team. So, so I like that a co-founder. So they're not just investing in one person. They know that you've got a good, you know, a good balance to the way that you're putting this together. 
So CJ, I know that there are some downfalls when you're getting investors. And I know that you probably could list a hundred downfalls, but for the sake of time, and just because this is a very meaty topic, I mean, we've already covered the minimum viable product and the pitch deck. And I feel like those in and of themselves could be eight hour sessions. And so let's not go there. Let's just say, hey, Here's a couple of pitfalls to avoid when you're doing this, just so that you don't just run up against a wall within the first five minutes. Right. Well, really, really important thing to do is um, if you're not sure, don't act like you are very sure. <laughs> All right. So be really honest because sometimes actually your investor or your potential investor is just asking you question to test you. They don't even care about whether or not the answer is correct. They just want to see how you respond to it, all right? So if you're being very honest, like, hey, look, uh, Mr. John, uh, this thing here, I, I really don't know. I haven't looked into it, but thank you so much for bringing it up. I'll definitely look into it and give you an answer um, next few days. Is that okay? So be really, really transparent. Don't act like you know everything. And in fact, hold you know, on. like... Don't yeah. Hold on, pause. Are you saying we don't have to have all the answers? No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. I mean, right? What a concept. You don't have to know everything and it's okay to say you don't know everything. I feel like vulnerability and a little bit of saying, hey, thank you for bringing that up. I'm going to look it up goes miles and miles, right? Yeah, yeah. Because you are getting them on board for the next five years or 10 years or forever until you sell it off. Uh, exit together or until you close down hopefully it doesn't happen so yeah it's a journey that you're going to be embarking on together so might as well be really honest because honesty is going to be the key in the coming journey that you have for example every quarter they might be expecting a quarterly report that you promised before all right it's always good to have that in the beginning and what if you're not doing well so you got to be really honest and say, hey, look, we ha we're having difficulty, unforeseen cir circumstances, three co-founders left, and they took away 80% of our, our, of our clients. Um, but then this is what we're going to do. So, so honesty is definitely something where you can always count on. And, you know, because co covering things up will always never lead to anything good. Yeah, so just be really, really honest. <laughs> Yeah. And just hold on to that um, value for the from now until forever when it comes to getting someone on board as investors. Yeah. And I like that, too, because I like the way you said, hey, you know, we had some co-founders leave, but this is what we're going to do. And so you didn't just go to them with a problem. You went to them with some potential solutions, but mainly you went to them with truth, truth and integrity. So that goes everywhere in any business. Is there maybe one more like big, big downfall that you would say, hey, just really keep this in mind before you go any further. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Do not overpromise. <laughs> Do not overpromise. Be again, just be real, you know, because overpromising can just lead to expectation, not manage, right? If you if you're not good, just say you're not good, right? Um, because sometimes people just invest in the in you because they like your honesty. They like how blunt you are so you don't always have to be that guy that just paint a beautiful picture we're gonna be doing this we are doing that you know making up numbers because seasoned investors know that business is not an easy thing to do right um, and only amateur investor want to see numbers that are always going up so seasoned investors they most likely have run businesses themselves they most likely have gone through hardships so they've been in the same boat or they are in the same boat perhaps you know currently in their business so yeah just just be really honest and i think when it comes to the nature of our business okay fitness businesses it's very important to just pre-qualify the investor and say look the only reason why you, you you're coming in is because you truly believe that this investment is going to help bring impact to lives of many if you want high return fast money don't come here you just have to be very firm maybe not that upfront, maybe polish up your language a little bit. Just say, hey, look, you know what? Perhaps for us, we make we make sure that investors are our clients so that they don't come in just for the money. Mm. Because otherwise they will be thinking your fitness business is just like their forex trading or their crypto. They want fast money in, fast money out. 
So this is not going to be something where, um, you know, you, you can actually deliver. Pain a dream and also at the same time just be really really honest that this is not going to be the the cash cow that you could be expecting and yeah. funny enough many of our investors are okay with it you know we we the, sometimes the more you don't like the more you put on barriers the more people want it <laughs> it's not like you know you open up the door say come in come in it's gonna be great it, it will scare off people so for us in a way we put on barriers to make them want it even more. <laughs> well, I think, you know, that's an, an amazing point. I think that the more, um, the more, I don't want to say unreachable, but the more boundaries you set, the more you value yourself and set standards, the more people are like, wow, I'm impressed. I mean, he or she is laying the groundwork and setting these standards and they are not going to let up on their standards. And so that means you get quality investors. You get people, like you said, your clients who believe in the business, not just fast money. That's that's huge. I'm glad you brought that one up. Um, so CJ, I feel like this is a, I learned a ton. I mean, I really did. And it's funny because I'm pitching somebody right now on in a speaking engagement and I'm building something very, very similar. It's very much the same concept of, building a pitch deck and solving a problem and what can I do and, and standing my ground on standards, but not over promising. So, um, this was massively helpful. I really appreciate you coming on CJ Lee and, um, doing all the good work that you're doing across, uh, well, you're in Malaysia now, but you've been in Thailand, you've been in New Zealand, you've been a lot of places. So thank you for joining us. And uh, if somebody wanted to reach out to you to ask any questions, how would they reach you? Well, you can reach out to me via Instagram, rise.with.cj or LinkedIn, CJ Lee. Perhaps you might want to type move private fitness, then you get me directly. Yeah, the last thing I would like to just add in quickly is you got to be a really good storyteller, okay? Because that helps take people beyond the four walls that you are in when it comes to pitching, right? So become a very good storyteller that is backed by facts and stats. I'm going to leave that to you, Angie, and the rest of you. Oh, you're leaving me hanging. I kind of want to hear the story. <laughs> be a good storyteller, huh? Give me a snippet of your story, if you would. Just a snip. So basically, you just come up with the actual story, not fake one, all right? Actual story of the how you went through this whole journey and you realized you wanted to start this business or you realized why you wanted to become a coach and you realized why you wanted to take things to the next level, right? So it has to be both, all right, a bit painful and it has to be in a way you don't rush it. You just go through the details of, you know, when you're going through the struggle, what was it like, how you wish there could be a solution, but you were just so despair for it. And therefore, it's a conviction for you to get on this mission to build something up. And I have rallied my co-founders who share the same mission. You know, we believe that, let's say, for example, you might build a studio for, for, for women. It's, okay, maybe a story of, we believe women of all age deserve the right to have the strength to carry themselves, to have the confidence. And strength in a woman is beauty within. So, you know, so, so this can be a really good conclusion to your story, right? Sell your belief. And especially, I, I would say, in the, in the really end of your pitch, right? You show the numbers. This is how much we're pitching for. This is the percentage you're get, getting. But then the, the very last slide, you must have an, the next slide where you end it with a dream, a, a story. Because, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of time the numbers will speak to the logical mind of your potential investor. A story will then speak to their heart. So investment, to be honest, is not a very logical thing for people to do, right? It does involve a lot of heart, a lot of emotion that comes with it because they are putting six figures, five figures into something they haven't never seen. So you can't just talk to their brain, right? Yeah. You have to talk to their heart. 
You have to talk to the heart. And you have me at beauty within because at the end of the day, you know, uh, external beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but beauty within just creates a space for everyone to feel good about themselves and the world around them. So thank you again, CJ Lee. Thanks to all of our strong mind, strong body listeners. My hope for you is that you get to go out there and start that dream to open your first gym. All right. See you next week. Thank <laughs> you.